name's Diane Hart, and I'm, uh, my, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, my husband, Peter. Um, many of you know Peter as a person who builds bird boxes, or he takes bird photographs, or he rides his bike around campus. But I thought maybe you'd like to know some things about him that almost nobody knows. Because this is a professional presentation, and you know, I want it to look professional. This is the big, this is the big deal, the big reveal. So um, I'm going to talk about his professional recognitions because he's very um, humble about this. He's a member of three professional societies and a fellow of all three of them. He's been inducted into two halls of fame, received the IEEE Golden Jubilee Award for one of the most influential papers over the last 50 years in information sciences and theory. He also holds 125 patents, and according to Google Scholar, who tracks this stuff, his publications have been cited in over 127,000 professional papers, theses, whatever, the things that Google tracks. That puts him at the top or near the top of the heap of uh, cited authors in multiple fields, and I had to list them in case I forgot one. Computer science, artificial intelligence, robotics, we lost our signal. Information theory, pattern classification, and computer vision. And I've never told that to anybody else before. You're the first to know. Thank you. Don't so, anybody breathe deeply. Everybody can hear me? Because I, I know I don't have a very loud speaking voice. Okay, well, good morning. Um, this morning I'll tell you the story of Shaky, the world's first robot with artificial intelligence. I'll cover how things got started, how we made Shaky, what Shaky could actually do, how some people at the time reacted to Shaky, and how Shaky has impacted our lives today. And I'll close with some brief comments about today's robots and maybe where things are going from here. A common reaction on first seeing Shaky, frankly, is it doesn't look like much. So I like to remember the first gasoline car and the first airplane because they don't look like much either, frankly. And I think probably for similar reasons. Each was the first of its kind, so there was no prior models or examples to go by. The supporting technology in each case was primitive. So we did the best we could to provide the essential components. Um, a few years ago, SRI made a five-minute video about Shaky. It's a nice introduction, so let's see if we can get that rolling, and then I'll take it from there. Can you hear that? Shaky was the world's first mobile intelligent robot, embodying numerous breakthroughs in artificial intelligence, robotics, computer vision, navigation, and other research areas. The robot was developed from 1966 to 1972, by SRI International, then called Stanford Research Institute, and its legacy and impact are still very much alive today. Shaky's really the great-grandfather of things like self-driving cars and even military drones. The hardware was really pretty primitive, but the software architecture and the software algorithms are what changed the world. I think we all thought we were doing really interesting stuff, so it didn't really uh, dawn on us that we were doing anything special. Shaky established a position about what we should be thinking about as possible, as feasible. To understand why Shaky is so important, we have to go back to 1966, and we have to understand where AI research was at that time. Well, you have to remember that it was pretty much of a, a, a greenfield when Shaky started. All over the country and even outside of the United States, people were beginning to build the components to artificial intelligence. Nobody had tried at the time that Shaky was launched to integrate all the components of AI and robotics into a single um, moving vehicle that could reason about the world, could sense the world around it, and could take actions. Prior to 1966, there were no robots, or at least, not intelligent ones. The concept of an intelligent robot was limited to the realm of fiction. You will meet a charming character in the robot, always at your service. When you read the title of the original proposal, it was something like a mobile automaton for reconnaissance. 
And the reason we called it an automaton was because until shaky, you couldn't go to a funding agency and say, I want money to make a science fiction kind of device. And so we needed a name. And finally, Charlie, in his inimitable fashion, said, it shakes like hell when it moves. Let's just call it shaky. Key components of Shakey's hardware were a TV camera to observe its environment, an antenna radio link, bump detectors, and a push bar to move objects. My role was mainly get the images and get the whatever coordinates they needed to determine where they were and uh, you know extract the information from the image. I remember when I first saw it, gee, that looks like a dishwasher <laughs> you know, on wheels. While charming, Shaky wasn't impressive for its looks. It was the AI and programming advancements that made it famous. We structured Shaky software in four distinct layers. And that was the first time that a layered architecture was used for robots. Shaky's pioneering software architecture paved the way to a new era of AI and robotics. The SRI team later developed Flaky, a research robot that demonstrated fuzzy logic and goal-oriented behavior. Then came Centibots, one of the earliest projects in Swarm Robotics, where 100 autonomous robots demonstrated the ability to map a complex area collaboratively. I like how it's code that isn't just turning numbers into other numbers. You get to see the thing come to life right next to you. Shaky also inspired research in natural language-based interactions, leading to the popular speech-based technologies that we use today. Shaky's breakthrough in computer vision is now used to help drivers stay in their lanes. And every time you get driving directions on your phone or a navigation system, you are benefiting from the A-Star navigation algorithm, first invented for Shaky. Even NASA's Mars Exploration Rovers use navigational techniques that were first launched with Shaky. The future is things like potentially having uh, teams of uh, autonomous aircraft that could go out, for example, and do firefighting, and doing this either fully autonomously or potentially in tandem with human-piloted aircraft that can go out and work with them collaboratively. Shaky now resides in the Computer History Museum, visible to hundreds of thousands of visitors annually. And in 2017, Shaky was honored with an IEEE Milestone Achievement Award. The Shaky Milestone is important because, first of all, Shaky is the world's first mobile intelligent robot. In addition, this is the first IEEE Milestone in the areas of either robotics or artificial intelligence. Looking back, more than 50 years after the Shaky project began, it's inspiring to see how one small team can make such an impact how one ambitious idea continues to benefit our lives. How one robot changed the world. We didn't realize, I think, any of us, what the significance of this was. We knew we were the first, but nobody knew where it was going, and I don't think any of us would have predicted what happened. Shaky planted the flag way out there. It's a model of the kind of ambitious projects that we should be looking at in the future. Okay, so um, I'll point out a few features of Shaky that weren't mentioned in the video. Most of this head assembly was occupied by a laser range finder that we developed that works on the principle of triangulation. Um, we didn't actually use a range finder very much because as it turned out, we were able to extract the information Shaky needed from the video images. But at the outset, we didn't know if that would be possible. It had never been done before. So we made the range finder. Uh, the uh, Shaky, of course, was decades before digital cameras. So the TV camera was based on a Viticon tube. And it, of course, produced an analog TV signal, but we needed a digital image. So we had to design and build our own analog to digital converter because nothing was available. You might think that this big box, kind of the body, housed Shaky's computer. But no, it housed the electronics that controlled Shaky's sensors and motors, and also housed the communication gear that allowed Shaky to communicate over this radio link with a big mainframe computer in the next room. 
cheating, I know. Um, <clears throat> the actual computing was done on this DEC PDP-10. For comparison, your Apple Watch today has about 32,000 times as much memory as this room-sized computer had 50 years ago. The uh, video setup uh, delivered a digital image having a resolution of 120 by 120 pixels, picture elements, and could record 16 shades of gray ranging from black to white. Again, for comparison, your iPhone camera has about a thousand times as many pixels and records millions of colors. This is the floor plan that you saw a bit of in the video. Some rooms connected by doorways, populated with boxes of various sizes and shapes. Um, the walls were high enough so Shaky couldn't see over them, though we could. And we had to keep the environment pretty simple, because as you've seen, Shaky's hardware resources were really pretty limited. So what could Shaky do? Uh, quite a few things. I'll describe these three that are the most important. It could visually perceive its surroundings. It could navigate autonomously from place to place. And it could create and execute its own action plans to solve problems. So I'll tell you just a little bit about each. Using the example from the video, it wasn't too hard to find the baseboard because of the high contrast and then to find the bottom edge of the baseboard. But fitting uh, straight lines or potentially even curves to the segments was a challenge. Not conceptually, that's easy, computationally. How do you do that super fast and super efficiently? I invented a method that solved this problem based on this diagram. Um, I won't go into the details, but it was based on an earlier invention by a guy named Huff, but I never thought to change the name. So a few years ago, I wrote a history column describing the series of steps that led to this invention. And, and then the navigation, the A-star shortest path algorithm that was mentioned in the video. Remember the word algorithm, but just a fancy word that means a set of steps to be followed by a computer, like a recipe. So, finding the shortest path on a digital map is harder than you might think. And the reason is that the number of possible combinations of left and right turns mounts up so quickly that it's referred to as a combinatorial explosion. So there's no formula for this. So if you can't find some way to contain that explosion, the computer will bog down and take forever to get you an answer. Of course, Shaky's environment is much simpler than this illustration, but we were looking for a method that would scale up to real world proportions. The basic intuition behind this algorithm is really pretty simple. As a star searches turn by turn through these combinations, it's continually making a best guess, an educated guess, about which direction the shortest route lies in, and it searches in that direction next. When a star gets to the destination, it doesn't stop searching unless it can guarantee that it hasn't overlooked a shorter route. There's, a, there's, an interesting, there's an interesting backstory about how this invention came about. One afternoon, I was wandering down the halls at SRI, and I chanced upon an intense conversation between two close colleagues, <clears throat> Nils Nilsson and Bertrand Rayfield. They had an idea for solving this that they thought might work. So I went home that night, and Diane remembers that I stayed at the wall for an hour thinking about what they told me, and I concluded that Nils and Bert were really onto something. That if we kind of fleshed out their idea in a very specific way, we'd have a search algorithm with two remarkable properties or characteristics. First, it would always work. It'll always find the shortest route under any circumstances. And second, more remarkably, it would do the least possible amount of computation that was required to find that shortest route. And I thought we could prove those propositions mathematically. And we did. Um, <laughs> so people ask about the A-star name so often that last year a professor at Ohio State wrote a little history column about it. And the short answer is that star or asterisk notation 
is commonly used in the field of mathematical statistics. And when I was working on the mathematical proofs of A star, I just adopted that notation and it stuck. So next, robot planning. So first, the obvious question, why does a robot need to create its own plans? And the reason is that if you're making a general purpose robot and you'd like to be able to solve a wide variety of problems under a broad range of conditions, it's not feasible to provide a pre-programmed so-called canned solution for every possible situation. So instead what you do is you provide a small set of building blocks, basic actions, plus a planning ability that can string together a sequence of these basic actions into a plan that solves some problem. And one more thing, as a robot executes a plan, it constantly has to check or monitor to see how things are going. Because, of course, things don't always go according to plan, and when that happens, the robot has to respond in some appropriate way. So in this experiment, um, we asked Shaky to block a particular doorway with a box. We gave Shaky uh, basic actions to navigate from place to place, to go through a doorway, which was tricky, we actually called it bumble through, uh, and to push a box around. But there was no pre-programmed solution to this whole problem. But we did give Shaky a revolutionary planning ability. So on its own, Shaky came up with this five-step plan, a sequence of five basic actions to solve the problem. So step one, navigate to the nearest doorway. Step two, go through the doorway. Step three, go to the next doorway. Step four, go through that doorway. And stop step five, block the target doorway with a box. But as Shaky starts executing this plan, a gremlin in a black cape <laughs> takes a new box, one that's not known to Shaky, and puts it right in Shaky's planned path. Rascal, right? But Shaky's continually checking, and so it sees the new box, it plots its position, and on the fly creates an updated plan that takes the new box into account and solves the problem. And uh, one more thing, every time Shaky makes a plan, it saves it in a form that allows it to be reused in a subsequent problem. So the more Shaky plans, the smarter it gets. So that's something about Shaky how did people react to Shaky? There was such a range of reactions. This feature story in Life magazine, I thought, was a little on the breathless side. You can read the subhead, the fascinating and fearsome reality of a machine with a mind of its own. They were so excited they couldn't even spell Shaky right. Arthur Clarke dropped by for a demo just after the movie 2001 came out. And he saw the demo. And his opinion was that Shaky had a ways to go before it caught up with HAL 9000, which you remember was the computer in 2001. So you know, he was right about that. Uh, Hubert Dreyfus was a professor of philosophy at UC Berkeley. And he argued on very deep philosophical terms or grounds that artificial intelligence wasn't merely difficult to achieve, it was in principle impossible. So one afternoon I trekked up to Berkeley and I had this big debate, big public debate with Bert. And of course, neither of us convinced the other. But it must have been entertaining because they were standing room only in this big lecture room and I didn't notice anybody walking out. Whenever somebody tells me or I hear that something I'm really interested in is impossible, I like to remember this quote from Lord Kelvin. Um, he was a Scottish physicist, one of the most eminent scientists of his day, and he stated flatly in 1895 that heavier-than-air flying machines are impossible, only to be proved wrong by the Wright brothers just eight years later. Or as Charlie Rosen used to say, there are always the naysayers. 
One afternoon, some school teachers came by for a visit. We had kind of an open door policy. It was pre-badges and all that. So some school teachers came by for a visit and we showed them around. And as they were leaving, one of them asked me, what do you really do here in the Artificial Intelligence Center? I must have looked a little puzzled because we had just shown her shaky. So she said, well, this robot, that's just your hobby, isn't it? <laughs> there was a high school kid named Bill Gates. <laughs> and he heard about Shaky, and he drove down from Seattle with his buddy Paul Allen for a demo. And many decades later, we asked him about it, and he remembered thinking how cool it was. Uh, one of my most memorable, memorable visitors was a U.S. government contracts auditor. So <clears throat> we were funded by a Department of Defense contract, so once in a while an auditor would come by. So before I tell you the story, I have to tell you two facts. First of all, our Artificial Intelligence Center was in the first group of a half a dozen or so nodes, they're called, that comprised the original ARPANET, which was the forerunner of the internet. So I've had an email address since, I guess, 1971. <clears throat> Second, you know that computers represent information as bits, zeros and ones. Computer networks operate by bundling bits together into what are called packets. And these packets of bits are what get shipped around on networks. So back to the auditor. He shows up in my office, very brusque, all business, no doubt ex-military, pulls a file out, and he just starts barking questions at me so sharply, I almost jumped, uh, jumped out of my skin. His first question is, Dr. Hart, I guess that's me, says, it says here that you've taken delivery of 9,736,000,000, some such number, packets of bits. Is that correct? <laughs> well, I hadn't seen that one coming. I said, it sounds about right. I can look into it. That'll do. Here's the next question. Dr. Hart, did you establish any procedures for inspecting the condition of these incoming packets? <laughs> well, you could see where this was going, right? So what do I do? So I thought, you know, computer communications usually include a feature called error detecting codes. Close enough. So I said, yes, checks it off. And he says, Dr. Hart, did the packets arrive in good condition? I said, was there any tarnish or corrosion on any of the bits? I could reassure him on that my bits were tarnish and corrosion free. And then he has one last question. He says, hey, Dr. Hart, did you provide adequate warehousing facilities for these billions of packets? And I thought, didn't you see all those big disk drives in the machine room just across the hall? But I just smiled nicely and said yes. Thanked me and left. Well, I mean, that, that, you can't make this stuff up. That's really the way it was back then. Well, that was then, this is now. <clears throat> um, has Shaky had any long-term legacy? Well, the answer is yes, quite a bit, as the um, video suggested. I'll start with this quote from James Kuffner, the director of robotics research at Google. He said, it's truly amazing how both in terms of architecture and algorithms, the Shaky project was ahead of its time and became a model for future robot systems for half a century. So as you saw in the video, until Shaky, robots literally were in the realm of science fiction. They were fantasies. And, um, Shaky proved that the fantasy could be made real, thereby kicking off a stream of development that continues right to the present day. So in my mind, that's Shaky's most important legacy. But beyond that, there were a number of technical innovations that we made that turned out to be important. I'll tell you about these two bottom ones that affect our everyday lives. So first, this A-star algorithm that I told you about. As you saw in the video, Every time you ask your phone or your car's navigation system to get you to some destination, some implementation of A star is computing your driving directions. In the world of video games, 
A star is the algorithm of choice for computing the paths of characters. As you see in this quote from this well-known game guy, A star is by far the most used and useful algorithm for pathfinding in games. And in space, all the Mars rovers, including Perseverance that's active there right now, use a version of A star called Field D star to do the navigation. Mars rovers need to have the ability to navigate on their own because the communication time between the Earth and Mars is roughly an hour at the speed of light. So you can't sit in the jet propulsion lab in Pasadena and drive a Mars rover like it's a video game. Imagine sitting in your car in an empty parking lot and you're driving at only two miles an hour, but when you turn the steering wheel, it takes an hour till you see what happens. Um, this is the paper that introduced A Star to the technical community. The title is a little bit obscure because it contains some kind of secret code words. The word formal in this context means there are mathematical theorems in here. The word heuristic was popular in the early days of AI. It comes from the Greek and it means something like leading to the discovery of or um, hints for solving. And I chose that title because I like the apparent contradiction between formal and heuristic, because up to that point, nobody had ever proved mathematical theorems about hints in AI programs. <laughs> but I, I thought it would take, you know, really attract a lot of attention. But Nils and Burton and I were surprised, I'll say even shocked, when the manuscript for this paper was rejected repeatedly by the most prestigious journals of the day. I guess we were just too far outside the box for the reviewers. Um, we finally got it published in actually a very low prestige um, publication, and then it really did get noticed. Um, Diane mentioned Google Scholar tracks citations, and 11,000 citations to a single paper is really quite a large number at least in that field. And then the method I described for finding dashed lines or curves and images. Nowadays that's used for manufacturing automation applications and especially in automobiles. Um, for many years Mercedes-Benz has had a feature they call active lane keeping assist. I happen to know the Daimler-Benz guys in Ulm, Germany who developed that system and they love telling me Peter, we're using the method you invented for Seiki. Um, it's generally believed that all the other manufacturers like Tesla use the same method, but because of trade secrecy, I couldn't tell you that for sure. So where are robots today? Um, there's so many different kinds that it's hard to know what even to call a robot anymore. These big robot arms do automobile assembly at the other extreme, this is a soft, cuddly, what's called companion robot. Of course, we have the Roomba vacuum cleaner. By the way, this company was a spinoff from the MIT AI lab. Uh, this is a delivery robot by a company called Savioc in San Jose. Seems to be pretty similar to our dining room robot. This is the big Da Vinci surgical robot it's strictly speaking what's called a teleoperator because it's controlled by a surgeon. And up in the top we have this incredibly agile two-legged Atlas robot from Boston Dynamics, which by the way is a spin-off from the Carnegie Mellon uh, AI lab. Um, two-legged locomotion is actually technically very different, uh, difficult. When you're walking, every step you take is actually a controlled fall. You catch yourself with your other leg, we all hope. Um, you're what's called statically unstable. If you try to freeze in mid-stride, you'll fall. So the robot that I'm personally most interested in doesn't exist today. It would combine some combination of shaky type smarts, some updated version of shaky type smarts, with the mechanical abilities of the Boston Dynamics machines. 
And here's why I'm interested. This graph shows the percentage of people on the earth under the age of five and over the age of 65. A few years ago, the world went through a tipping point. Where the, for the first time in the history of our species, there were more people on the planet over 65 than under five. This trend is certain to accelerate and it's going to have profound consequences on many levels. And of course, one level is going to be, one consequence, there's not going to be enough younger people available to take care of all the older people. <laughs> right now, in the U.S. today, we rely heavily on immigrants to help older people age in place or to live independently. Immigrants are about 17% of the U.S. workforce, but 38%, more than twice that percent, of home care aides. That's not likely to be sustainable. And of course, that's only in the US. So what to do? Well, one possible solution is robots. And of course, people have noticed this, and there's quite a lot of work going on, especially in Japan. This is the Riken Robear. It's intended to lift older people, older adults, out of beds. And you see it being demonstrated here on a remarkably well-preserved older person. <laughs> this is another kind of companion robots. Everybody recognizes that social isolation is a big issue for seniors. Uh, this one is called Pepper. Um, it can recognize individual human faces and can also recognize actually emotional expressions on faces. And you can buy it today from SoftBank Robotics. How much? The robot itself is only a few thousand dollars, but you need a several hundred dollar a month subscription, so the three-year cost is something like ten to twenty thousand dollars. There are even very specialized robots like this eating assistant from a Canadian company, but we're still a very, very long distance from making a dent in this, pro in this uh, problem. So to conclude the story of Shaky. <clears throat> We initially offered Shaky to the Smithsonian Museum in Washington. No, I did. But the curator there, you've got to find the right, you know, they have a hundred curators, guy in charge of this sort of stuff. So we find the right curator, and he asks, he says, well, he says, can this Shaky roll around every afternoon at three o'clock for the school children? I said, what are you, nuts? Shaky needed this giant computer that no longer exists. And besides, none of your other vehicles roll around every afternoon. Why shaky? But no sale. But when Len Shustek um, started up the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, they were delighted to have shaky, and it now serves as the centerpiece of the museum's exhibit on AI and robotics. So looking back, what did we achieve? Well, less than we hoped. We were just brimming with ideas for a second generation robot. But a little before our Department of Defense contract was coming up for renewal, Congress passed something called the Mansfield Amendment. And the Mansfield Amendment prohibited Department of Defense funding for any research unless it has a direct and apparent relationship to a specific military function. Now, I sometimes say that we invest in research for the same reason that we plant trees, to benefit future generations. But Mike Mansfield from Montana apparently never got that memo. And his amendment, a just stunningly short-sighted amendment, killed a lot of great research programs in this country for a long time, including ours. I really wanted to call it a stupid amendment, but Diane told me I shouldn't say that, so I didn't. <laughs> anyway, Nils and I hustled around looking uh, for alternative support for robotics research, but there was none to be had, so there was nothing for it but to declare victory and move on. So, looking back across all those years, what did we achieve? Well, I have to say, <laughs> probably more than we recognized. The end. Thank you. <laughs>